My name is Tessie Okwe. I want to appreciate God for this awesome privilege to stand on this exalted altar. Um, God has blessed me and added another year to my years today, this Sunday morning. I want to thank God and appreciate him because I'm celebrating this birthday in the church today and not in the uh, mortuary. I really want to thank God for the word of God that has been coming from this altar. It has strengthened, uh, strengthened me in my challenges. It has made me to live above all my adversities. It, uh, been a, it has made me to be a solution to many. God has added another car to my cars in the name of Jesus. I praise his name forever. Hallelujah. God will duplicate shame in your life today. Praise the Lord, exceeding grace. I want to thank God for the life of my sister. Okay, Grace. My name is Grace Gochku. I want to thank God for the life of my sister. She was ill some months ago. The illness that almost took her life. But today, she's celebrating her birthday being, today being the 23rd of November. I want to celebrate alongside with her in Jesus' name. I also pray, um, thank God for my brother. It took, he finished his school 2010, and it took him time, some years before he gained admission last year into law school. We've been praying along with him, and he loves animals a lot. During that period, while he was doing his law school, he combined it with animals, as in rearing animals. And we are thinking, ah, this boy, I don't know. But at the end of the day, thank God that God has made it. He's now a barrister. He has been called. To Hallelujah. Three years stagnation broke is now a barista. Praise the Lord. My name is Adaji John. I serve in a sanctuary unit. Yes, it happened on Thursday this last week. Every true child of God is an ambassador of Christ. And I believe the word. So, the job that the company gave to me before, the devil take it away from me. But now, that the same company traced me to where I am working now, giving me that the same job again. I have come to return all the glory to God. Hallelujah. Via Shiloh's sacrifice, he got a contract after four months of stagnation. My name is Jerry Sin Obol. I'm thanking God for granting me success in my bar finance examination. I am now in Abuja for my call coming up on the 25th. I'm really grateful for this great opportunity. That's why I'm here to thank God. Hallelujah. You are the next one to share your testimony in Jesus' name. Shall we lift up our voice now, our seated position, to appreciate God for these glorious things God has done? Let's give Him praise. Let's give Him thanks. Let's glorify His holy name. In Jesus' precious name, I will give me thanks. As I welcome you this morning to this special impartation service for the release of honor upon your life, you and shame shall be eternally separated. Say loud amen to that. Yeah. Number one instrument of impartation is words. Words. Impartation means release of life. Communication of grace. Transference of virtue. Release of life. Communication of grace, transference of virtue. And this is carried out by the words. For Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, The word which I speak unto you are spirit and life. The word of a man is the life of the man. Just as the word of God is the life of God. 
God didn't touch man at creation. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, he only spoke to him. Genesis 1 28, and God blessed them. How? By saying unto them, God's word is God's life. That is why whosoever speaks into your life is imparting you with his life. If you don't have a spiritual cover and you listen to an herbalist, whatever he says upon your life comes to stay upon your life. That's why they call it spell. They cast spell on people. In the same way, we cast blessing upon people. So today as I speak to you, I am casting blessing upon your life. I am throwing blessings upon your life. I am imparting blessing upon your life. I am releasing to you the same virtues I've received upon your life. Yeah. The honor I enjoy, you shall enjoy. Yeah. For a long time now, when God's servant, Bishop Oedepo, my father, speaks to me, he keeps saying, the Lord will honor you. The Lord will honor you. Then I check through scriptures and I discover that the most precious impartation that Moses communicated to Joshua was honor. 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 Numbers chapter 27, verses 18 to 20. Take ye Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him, and thou and set him before Eleazar the priest and before the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. That is, speak the word to him. Impartation comes via handling via the word and verse 20 thou shalt put some of your honor upon him thou shalt put some of your honor upon him today i put some of this honor upon you and what will be the effect he said and the congregation of israel shall be obedient to him so honor means transference of authority the children of israel shall be obedient to him stretch your hands here whatever obeys my father bishop Oedipo, whatever obeys me must obey you from today my father and obeys me will begin to obey you from today sickness will obey you dignity will answer to you respect will answer to you high esteem will become your portion from today money answers to me just as it answers to my father from today money will answer to you i don't pray for success success attend to me from today success will be following you and overtake you whether answers to my spiritual fathers and the answer to me when i say to the weather change it changes 
from today everything you speak to to change for you will be changing on the other side receive honor today in the name of jesus every shame and reproach hanging around your family hanging around your career hanging around your children hanging around your spouse I command that they be shattered today in the name of Jesus. Place that hand on your head and pray in the Holy Ghost and declare, I receive honor. From today, I am living a honorable life. From today, I live a honorable life. From today, I live a honorable life. From today, I live a honorable life thank you lord blessed be your name lord in jesus precious name we are praying there is the grace of god and there are graces of men grace comes from god but he can choose to make some men custodians of this grace. Water comes from God, but you can preserve the water in a tanker. No man owns the grace, but there are men who are custodians of the grace. They are trusted and therefore are entrusted. They are trusted by God and therefore are entrusted with the grace. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Ye are partakers of my grace. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verses 1 to 4, Paul by revelation was talking about Moses and the children of Moses and of, of, of Israel and from verse 1 1st Corinthians chapter 10 he was talking about how they were baptized how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and they were baptized unto Moses they were inside Moses Moses was carrying them in the cloud and in the sea they were enjoying Moses. They were inside Moses. And they did all it the same spiritual mate. They, become, they became equal with Moses. They were enjoying like Moses. They were protected like Moses. I'd like you to know today, God's people, whatever brought you into this commission under the apostolic leader of his servant has brought you into the same blessing. The same grace. Whatever we don't suffer, you will not suffer again. <laughs> if you believe, shout, I believe. I, believe. I said, whatever we don't suffer, you will never suffer again. <laughs> we don't suffer barrenness, you will never suffer barrenness again. <laughs> we don't suffer emptiness, you will never suffer emptiness again. <laughs> we don't beg, you will never beg. We don't sorrow. You will never sorrow again. We win every day, everywhere. From today, you will never lose again. Now, in the next one minute, I'll be praying in the Holy Ghost, looking at different direction, and I'd like you to set your eyes on me and pray also as you receive. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Stand to your feet, everybody. Pray in the Holy Ghost. La ra ga 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 ta. Tostik again. Brandalasha. Receive it. No ho brande ke 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 ke. Receive honor. Receive honor. Adara ga ga ga. Endele re ka ga. Ete ka ga kie to koto. Madaye. Bradaga. Brandolos kate. Dia da sa sa. Dia da sa sa. Dia sa sa. Zere ka. Ge ge ga ga. Ge re ande kota baba. Boshare. Boshare. Boshare, Boshare, Boshrekenakton, Doktok, Takton, Skete, Ekratakatagra, Gloto, 
No more shame, no more reproach, no more failure, no more deprivation, no more rejection. Dignity, honor is your portion. Dignity, honor is your portion. You'll be esteemed, distinguished authority. Receive right now. Hallelujah. In Jesus precious name we are praying Amen. now every level of honor that we enjoy go and enjoy it from today every level of authority that we demonstrate go and demonstrate in the name of Jesus so shall it be you go from today honor will be accorded to you in the morning service like this my wife will remember very well in 1991 God's servant just switched off and said come on my son with your wife and as we knelt before him he said the honor upon me I release upon you and from that day, I'm telling you, from that day, there is nowhere I go to, people beg me to honor me. Literally, we have this for you, we have that for you, we have that for you. We, just as they do to him. From today, whatever honor they do to us becomes yours in the name of Jesus. People don't plan to cheat me. From today, it will never be in the heart of anyone to cheat you again. People carry us with respect. They don't talk about us anyhow. They don't talk against us anyhow. From today, it will not be in the mind of people to walk against you again. Everywhere your name is mentioned from today, it will be for honor in the name of Jesus. If you have received this blessing, wave your hand and give glory to God. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. In Jesus' precious name, we are praying. Get seated, everybody. Are you glad you came this morning? Give God a big hand, everybody. Glory to God. Amen. The prophetic focus for the month is godliness is profitable unto all things. This week, there will be strange testimonies in your life. <laughs> Write it down. This week, there will be strange testimonies in my life. <laughs> if you believe it, put it down. You will come here next Sunday. They will be begging you to reduce your testimony. <laughs> Godly people don't suffer losses. Our godliness is not in vain. Even Satan can testify of that. In Job chapter 1, the Lord came down to Satan as he was going to and fro. He said, Satan, where are you coming from? Suppose from verse 8 down the line. Job chapter 1. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the house. A perfect and upright man. One that feared the Lord and eschewed evil. You see, even God could testify of the godliness of Job. Men may testify of your works. God testifies of your work. There are two different things. Men may testify of your possession and position. But God testifies of your person. Of your person. Men may testify of your reputation. God testifies of your character. And in verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? That means when you walk in the fear of God, it is not for nothing. 
And Satan began to testify in verse 10. Has thou not made an edge around him? That means when you are godly, you are protected. And about his house, and about all that he had on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands. So godliness is for something. Godliness is for blessing. When you are godly, you enjoy blessing. And his substance is increased in the land. Increases await godly people. Godly people don't suffer reduction. They suffer increases. You can't be godly and suffer decreases. Godliness attracts enjoyment. This is why our series of teaching for the month every Sunday. Every Sunday of the month is understanding the wonders of godliness. And today we are dealing with the fourth part of it. Quickly, be reminded, again, that godliness is not a state. It's not a state of perfection because none of us is perfect yet. But it is a tireless press. We are pressing towards perfection. We are pressing towards perfection. Just as it is in the race of life, there is no perfection. That's why sportsmen are improving every day. They go to the gym, they go to the track, they go to the field to improve. In those days, when the entire world had the best runner of sprint, 15 seconds, hey, that was a great achievement. Then men began to improve and it became 13. And then they improved again. And it became 10. And they keep improving every day. They keep improving. Sportsmen are always seeking to be perfect. In the same way spiritually, we have not reached perfection yet. We are improving. That's why the Bible says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. That means seek improvement. Strive to do better than you are doing. That's what godliness is about. Longing for improvement. Seeking to please your God. Philippians chapter 3 verses 10 to verse 14. Remember also that it is a long life battle. It's a long life journey. So don't stop. Keep pressing. Endure. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Run the race set before you with patience. Run with patience. Don't seek your rest. I love the hymn that says, Christian, seek not yet repose. Hear your guiding angel say, You are in the midst of enemies, in the midst of foes. Therefore, watch and pray. Watch and pray. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. The enemy, your adversaries, going about seeking for whom he may devour. Be vigilant, be sober, don't relax, don't give up. This morning, I release the grace upon you. The runner's grace. The pressing grace. The striving grace. The pressing grace. Up. If you receive it, raise your hand and shout, I receive it. Now, every Sunday we have presented to you some characteristics of sin. How sin manifests. You see, we need enlightenment. We need to know how Satan operates so that we can know how to stop him. And quickly, I show you two ways by which Satan operates. Number one, Sin is enticing. Sin is enticing. It entices people. Every man falls when he is enticed. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. He said, brethren, don't err. That's what he says in verse 12. And then in verse 13, he said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Now, if God does not tempt people, how does temptation come? Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn or enticed away. When he is enticed, when he is deceived, when he is drawn away of his own loss and enticed. And what happens after enticement? Then when lust has conceived, so there must be a conception process, it bringeth forth sin. Sin does not occur just like a child does not occur. There must be conception. If you don't conceive evil, you cannot end in sin. It bringeth sin and sin when it finishes job, it brings forth death. When it finishes, the end of sin is death. The agent of sin is enticement. The end of sin is death. Don't be deceived. Poison is inside. See a graphical picture here. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10. The wise man said, My son, if sinners entice you, consent not. Sin is manufactured by sinners. Don't go close to them. And if you find yourself around them and they seek to entice you, don't consent. That means don't agree. That means refuse, resist. Don't taste it. It is poison. It's enticing. It's like a bait that you put on a hook to catch a fish. Refuse to be caught. Now, in the same Proverbs chapter 5, from verse 3, see a very good illustration here of how especially the sin of fornication and adultery drags people. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb. I love you. I cannot do without you. Sending texts. I'm really missing you. That's somebody telling another man that is not the husband. When I, when I see you, I, I feel great. The lip drop as honeycomb. It drops. Sweet words. Get back to that passage. Sweet words as honeycomb. And our mouth is smoother than oil. Through different kind of technological means and dangerous photographs. And then verse 6, it went further to, I mean, verse 4, went further to tell us, I'd like you to look at that. But our end is bitter. As one would, sharp as two-edged sword. Verse 5, get down the line quickly. Our feet go down to death. Our steps take hold on hell. She's already inside hell seeking to pull you there. Verse 6. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, our ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. There, there are secrets behind that you cannot see with your eyes. That's the meaning. Dangerous. Don't go close to it. Then he went on in verse 5, verse 7. He said, hear me now. O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her. And come not near the door of her house. There are places you don't go close to. You don't go close. He didn't come near not the door. Don't say, eh, I'm anointed. I have faith. He said, don't go close. Oh. Don't go close. This thing is more than anointing. Don't go close. Don't go close. Don't go close. He said, Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the crowd. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. You lose everything. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. That's the ultimate. To consume a man. That is just an example. 
and then you begin to say how have i hated instruction and my heart despised reproof i have not obeyed the voice of my teachers so me i'm obeying this morning not incline my ear to them that instructed me that's what happened to samson judges chapter 16 verse 5 the lords of the philistines looked at delilah and said go to him and entice him entice him they said unto her entice him and see where in his great strength lie and by what means we may prevail against him so enticement in the end prevails against a man that we may bind him to afflict him may you not suffer affliction that we may bind them that we may afflict them that is the end of saying don't go close to it if you go to a store don't go close to where they are selling wine because you don't need it if you go there satan will show you alcohol that is five percent five percent and then he will tell you five percent is not bad now just five percent you are not a drunkard just five percent it's good for your health it's a tonic to your blood and then you look this way look that way no one are there pick it <laughs> enticement that's how it comes enticement you see money that does not belong to you i said you know you are in need now children's school fees is not paid just only hundred thousand you are not a bad thief there are people who steal billions enticement 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 you will not be a victim yeah. number two way by which sin come or the nature of sin is sin is secretive sin is secretive people do evil things in the secret where nobody can see them David committed sin in the secret. Nobody saw him. If you read the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He was walking in the veranda of his house. And then he saw one woman taking a bath in the neighborhood. I suppose David walked away from it. But his mind went back there. So he went back and saw the woman and it the thought was conceived and he sent for the woman had a fear with her she conceived and then david went further to commit another sin he sent for the husband who was in war front to come back home and traditionally a soldier should not go home when war is on david said go home so that he could lie with his wife and then the pregnancy could be said to be from him the man said i will never go home my captain is in war front i will never go home he did that he didn't go home and david sent to the captain in the war front and said put this young man in the forefront we had battle his hottest they put him there they killed him he died and david took uriah's wife to himself and god said you are gone you are gone you are finished and in second samuel chapter 12 verse 12 second samuel 12 verse 12 god said you have done this thing in the secret for thou didst it secretly but i will i would deal with you in the open i will punish you before everyone i will take you to the open sun beware of secret sins beware you may cover your sins so that no one will know but you cannot hide them from god beware psalm 139 verses 23 and 24 we cannot hide anything from god stop dealing in the secret search me oh god and know my heart try my thought and know my thoughts have try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting There are hidden works of darkness. Avoid the sin. 
because it will give occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Protect the name of your God. Protect the name of your kingdom. Protect the name of your church. Is it not a shame that people are saying, does he not say she attends that church? Does he not say he's a Christian? That is the greatest assault. The greatest assault on the kingdom of God. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. God said, because you have done this thing, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You have given occasion to the enemy to blaspheme. It should pain you when people are blaspheming your father's house because of your sins. How do you break the traps of sin? Number one, crave for the baptism of the spirit of obedience. Sin, simply put, is disobedience. So the cure to sin is the spirit of obedience. The spirit of obedience. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. All of it talk about the spirit of obedience. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my status. And you, it will enable you to keep my judgment and to do them. You need a spirit to be able to do what God commands. Just like Satan puts in man the spirit of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. That is what is called the spirit of obedience that worketh in the, that, that is a spirit that work in the children of disobedience. In the children of disobedience, Satan plants disobedience in people in the same way God plants obedience in his people. So you need to crave for it. Lord, baptize me with the spirit of obedience. How many of you will receive that this morning? Number two, how do you break the traps of sin? Engage the spirit of love. Engage the spirit of love for God. Why? Because in the world, we have the spirit of lust. L-U-S-T. Unfortunately, our world also call it love. There are different kinds of love. There is agape love. And there is fleshly love, lostly love. For instance, a man may say to somebody who is not his wife, I love you, with an intention to have an affair with her. That's not love, that is lust. And the cure to lust is love. First John chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible tells us about the, the, the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. And the pride of life. These are the things in the world. Verses 15 and 16. But the love of God is the cure to the lust of life. We see this example clearly in Solomon. At a time, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. At that time, there was no evil inside him. But at another time, Solomon loved strange women. Chapter 11 of the same book, verse 1. And Solomon loved strange women. He lusted after many strange women. And his heart was departed from God. Your heart is either with God or away from God. May you be filled with the love of God in your heart. Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O Lord, is forever. The scepter of your kingdom is the right scepter. For thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity. If you truly love God, you will hate wickedness. If you truly love God, you will hate evil. Because you will hate the things that God hates with perfect hatred. Thou lovest righteousness. If you are living in sin, it's an indication that you don't love God. You don't love him. Don't tell me you love God living in adultery. You don't love him. The love of God keeps us away from evil. 
because the love of God will not allow us to offend God. And thank God, Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is poured in our heart, is spread in our heart by the Holy Ghost that is given to us. Number three, how do you break the trap of sin? Live open, live transparent. Don't be secretive. Don't live a secret, a secretive life. Be open, be naked. Let people know your activities. If you are going to Zaria, tell your wife, I'm going to Zaria, not that I'm going to Kotangura. Live open, live secret. Don't hide anything. If you watch Jesus, Jesus never went anywhere alone. Jesus didn't do anything in the secret. When that woman was pouring oil on the feet of Jesus, it was in the open. It was as anointed as Jesus was. If Jesus went inside with that woman to anoint her feet with oil, something else may have happened. In the open. Live an open life. Don't go to places that you know are dangerous for you. Don't. Don't tempt yourself with evil because God does not tempt people with evil. If you discover some people are setting trap for you, don't go there. Don't go. Save your life, save your destiny. There is no way I'm going to in this world that somebody doesn't know about. It's a standard culture I've built into myself. Why? For my security. For my security. Number four, how do you break the traps of sin? Examine yourself daily. Examine yourself daily. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourself and know whether you are in the faith. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Let he that thinketh is stand. Take heed, lest he fall. Don't assume you are standing. The human nature will be drawing you every day. Examine yourself daily to see whether you are in the faith, whether you are still godly. Examine yourself. Did you see the prayer of David? He says, search my heart, O Lord. Search my heart, O Lord, and see if there be any evil way in my life. And take them off. Examine yourself daily. Let he that thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. People who fell didn't plan to fall. They didn't plan to fall. Satan strategized against them over a period of time. Some over six months, some over one year, some over two years. Satan is a planner, he's a strategist. He will plan and plan and plan until he catches you. That's why you need to keep examining yourself. Check your spiritual strategy. Are you still in tune? Is your prayer life still up? Are you still doing your fasting appropriately? Are you still studying the word of God? Examine yourself daily. Examine yourself. Set up a spiritual checklist for your life. Are you living in bitterness? Are you living in envy? Because those things can grow gradually to become a trade. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, as we begin to close, what are the benefits of godliness? What are the benefits of godliness? Number one benefit and prominent one for that matter of godliness is peace peace godliness engenders peace that passes all understanding please quickly note first isaiah chapter 48 verse 22 he said there is no peace to the wicked no peace unto the wicked there is no peace to a sinner Sin makes people restless. When Achan, I mean, when Cain sinned, he became restless. He was jumping from one place to another. He became a vagabond. Sin makes people restless because of guilt. When Adam and Eve committed sin, they went and hid themselves. Guilt overtook them. Sin makes people lose their peace. Isaiah chapter 32, verses 17 to 18. Look at the virtues of righteousness out there. And the work of righteousness or the benefit of righteousness shall be peace 
Righteous people are peaceful people. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. They are never moved. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings, dwellings and in quiet resting places. People ask me, why are you always calm? And among other things, I tell them, because I don't keep evil in my heart. I don't keep evil in my heart. I don't harbor evil in my heart. I live clean. I live plain. I live naked. There is nothing I am hiding. Peace. Number two, benefit of godliness is boldness. Godliness instills boldness and confidence. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. The wicked runneth when no one persuades him, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Even death does not scare them. A righteous man is not afraid to die. Daniel was not afraid to die. They put him and cast him into the fire. Fire couldn't consume him. And you know what he said when he came out into the lion's den? And what, you know what he said when he came out of the lion's den in verse 22? He said, in as much as innocency was found in me, and against thee, O king, I have not planned any evil. Therefore the Lord sent his angel and shot the mouth of the lion that he cannot hurt me. Because there is innocence in me, I have not planned to do you any hurt. You see, when you don't plan evil, you don't fear evil. When you don't plan evil, you don't fear evil. I am never afraid somebody is planning to hurt me. Why? Because I'm not planning to hurt anybody. You can't get me. You can't trap me. You can't do me evil because I don't plan evil. It is what a man sows that comes back to him. I don't sow seeds of evil, so I'm not expecting evil in my way. You are bold. You are confident. That's what happens when you live a godly life. Number three. Godliness guarantees answers to our prayers. It guarantees answers to our prayers. John chapter 8 verse 31. The word of God says, And we know that God heareth not sinners. God does not hear sinners. God does not listen to the prayer of sinners. And we know that God heareth not sinners. He does not hear sinners. Chapter 9 verse 31 of John. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he heareth him. If I hide iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, verse 18. Abacuc chapter 1, verse 13. God's eyes are purer than to behold evil. And number four benefit of godliness for this morning. Godliness makes you live a honorable life. Makes life honorable. Righteous people, godly people are honorable people. They may not have money, but they are honored in the society. They may not have position, but they are honored for their character. There are three things about man. His person, his position, and his possession. Today the world is celebrating possession, but God is celebrating his person, his character. Your person is your character. Money will go, but character remains. Even after you are dead, you are dead. Second Timothy chapter 2 from verses 20 to 22. If a man therefore purge himself from these things, he will be a vessel unto honor. A vessel unto honor. A vessel unto honor. Godliness makes you a vessel of honor. Look at Samuel. First Samuel chapter 9 verse 6. They were describing Samuel. They said there is a man of God in this city. There is a man of God in this city. He's an honorable man. First Samuel chapter 9 verse 6. He's an honorable man. And what about Samuel? Samuel was a godly man. First Samuel chapter 12 verses 3 and 5. He called all the children of Israel together. And he said, witness against me before the God. And before his anointed. Did I take anything from any of you? Whose offers have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Did I defraud any of you? Say it now, and I will restore it back to you. That was a man of integrity. Integrity 
equals honor. Sin devalues destiny. Sin erodes destiny. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. When man sinned, he went and hid himself. And then in verse 23, God chased him out. He chased him out. God drove him out in verse 23. He drove him out of the garden. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Sin reduced him. Righteousness exalts. Sin is a reproach. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. That's what sin does. Beware of sin. Don't move close to it. Psalm 51, verse 11. He said, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Sin drives people away from God's presence. It takes you from being honored before God to becoming dishonored in the wilderness of life. That will not be your portion. I say that will not be your portion. From today, according to scriptures, sin shall not have dominion over you. Will somebody say loud amen to that? Lift up your hand and begin to crave for godliness, for righteousness. Lord, clothe me with your righteousness. Lord, clothe me with godliness. I don't want to live sinful again. Speak to God right now. Speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we are prayed. The most honorable thing to do in life is to give your life to Jesus. Until you are born again, you don't know the meaning of honor. Somebody is here this morning, you know you are not born again. You've not given your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. You are living in the wilderness. You need to get back to the garden. The place of pleasure, the place of honor, the place of dignity. It will be my joy to pray for you this morning, to pray with you this morning. Whosoever you may be, I love you with the love of Jesus. I want to pray for you. I want you to experience a change in your life. As I'm talking to you right now, something is bearing witness in your heart. That is you, the pastor, is talking about. Don't close your mind. Don't blind your eyes. Don't allow pride to hold you down. If you're in that condition, I'd like you to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. You want to be saved? You want your sins forgiven? You want to be born again? You want to give your life to Jesus? You want to receive new life? I'm thanking God for your sincerity this morning. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. God bless you. Somebody's wondering, must I stand up? The question is this. How do you identify with a person? Simple. You stand with the person. If you truly want to be identified with Jesus, you stand with Jesus. You stand for Jesus. Let everybody know where you are standing. And you do that in the open. You do that publicly. Otherwise, you are not sincere. You are compromising. Therefore, some of you who are seated and wondering why you should stand up, you know why you should stand up now? Stand to your feet. I want Jesus in my life. Also, maybe you have given your life to him, but you are one leg in, one leg out. Today you fall, tomorrow you rise. Maybe you have even walked away from him. He wants to show you mercy this morning. You want to be restored back to the faith. I'd like you to also stand to your feet so I can pray for you and pray with you. God bless you. Everyone who wants Jesus to be restored back to him and to restore himself back to Jesus, stand to your feet. Now, all of you who have stood up, take your Bible and whatever you come to church with and start coming to the altar here quickly. Start coming to the altar. I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for you. God bless you. Hey, see yourself down here right now. Church, clap some more for my Jesus. He's saving many, many souls this morning. He's saving many, many souls this morning. Jesus is saving many, many souls this morning. Give him a bigger hand as a...